like to hear you talk, Matt. And uh, you know, <laughs> please, please don't hesitate and guide me because you know, in these deep, narrow nerdings, it, sometimes you wonder: Will people just go, "So what?" Or will they be amazed? But you know your listenership better than I do, so please feel free to guide me towards things that may interest the listener, <laughs> as opposed to the mega mega nerd. You know. Um, so yeah, so the the ukiyo-e prints. Um, they're important, and and you know I see them as as many sources of information, kind of like you know um, a radio telescope. You know that they're a tool that permits us to see back in time, but we have to decode what we're seeing. So you know, and very much like a telescope, right? Um, the um, ukiyo-e designers, the artists who made these prints. Well, the light entered their eye like it entered a telescope, bouncing off of the things around them, which included tattoos. This went into their brain, translated to a piece, you know, piece of paper, turned into a wood block, and, and this wood block, the light bounced off of it again and into my eye and into my brain. So I received that message from the Edo period, but it's mediated by a bunch of things and motivations and interpretations and and the ukiyo-e prints are important because, as a seeing tool, because they serve to, they were kind of crucial in defining the West's perceptions of Japan early on, and even today. I mean, you know, the average tattoo enthusiast who's interested in, in tattooing in that period, this is where he's going to see it. So that window, it's really interesting to characterize it, and I think it's a little, you know, I was a little surprised of, what I found in the ukiyo-e prints, what was actually shown in these prints, right? So ukiyo-e. Spans- you sent me, you sent me these pic- this picture before we came on air of your <laughs> notes, and you are a, a you are a madman uh, with your, as I said, detail. And I love that you've done these real detailed surveys because that's not the kind of I just don't think in that way. And I'm, but I'm so grateful to people that do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm also super fascinated at the moment. I'm working on a paper about this problem from the other direction. So how uh, ukiyo-e prints and how Japonism, the kind of fascination of the outside world with Japan and Japanese tattooing, fueled the rise in the creation of a tattoo industry uh, in the West and how these, how the tattoo industry and the the art industry, the design industry are really actually inter- interlinked in really interesting ways. So, yeah, well, I think... It, transformations along the way, though, right? Um, right, right, like, um, right. You know the the well, the North American tattooing tradition calls I think uh, is it grease ball Japanese? Yeah. <laughs> There's this great series uh, on Canadian the history of Canadian tattooing, and they 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 talk about that. You know the the early days at Ed Hardy working in Vancouver and them developing this style, which from looking at ukiyo-e prints, I really see the difference between what people consider you know modern interpretations of Japanese style tattooing and what was actually going on in Japan at the time. You know, there's a, yeah, there's a distance, exactly. it's normal, you know, there's a deformation. Um, so, yeah. So, so ukiyo-e, what we call ukiyo-e, um, really spans three centuries, right? So the 1600s, the 1700s, and the 1800s. Um, by the late 1700s, um, the prints start being made in color. And, and, and generally, you know, in, in, in the Western view, that's the ukiyo-e print, although it has a longer history, really kind of comes in its final, you know, colorful and tattoo-bearing phase is really the 19th century. So tattoos appear, oh, you know, there's, there's a very few in the early 19th century, but really takes off... Um, between 19, you know, 1927 would be the initial date, and we have them um, past the end of the Edo period into the Meiji period until about 1899. So it's kind of a narrow window um, in time that, that ukiyo-e um, shows us tattooing. And within that narrow window in time, what's remarkable is that um, 60%, I mean, I have a database and we'll get into that in a minute, but about 60% of the tattoo prints that were ever made were made between 1858 and 1868, so in a 10-year period. This is even narrower. You know, it's a snapshot in time. It's not a grand fresco 
doesn't cover the three centuries of ukiyo-e at all. So, yeah. Um, and the tattooing appears in ukiyo-e prints um, in a significant way and with a bang, with uh, Utagawa Kuniyoshi's um, rendition of uh, some of the 108 tattooed heroes of the Suikoden or Suikuchuan, which you referenced in, in, in your episode, right? So, so what's interesting about that is that, um, and, and there's a bit of a myth here to debunk, is that um, the common narrative will tell us that um, Kuniyoshi um, kind of got his hands on a translation of recently translated Suikoden, you know, in the decades before, and uh, added a bunch of tattooed characters to the original few characters that were in the Chinese version, and set off the craze. You know, I mean, I've read that all over the internet. Kuniyoshi started the tattoo craze, um, you know, introduced it, whatever. The thing is with Kuniyoshi, and I love Kuniyoshi, and he's, you know, in the top five all-time ukiyo-e print designers, but his um, impact and legacy on tattooing in the ukiyo-e prints is, is not as perhaps significant as the common narrative would like us to uh, see. So Kuniyoshi's overall production of tattoo prints is really in two short moments in his career. So um, in his early career, he's, he's having a bit of a hard time trying to find his way. Um, his schoolmate, Kunisada, um, is prosperous and successful. They don't hate each other. They like each other. You know, it's a friendly competition. But um, Kuniyoshi thinks he's more talented than Kunisada, and he's really looking for something <laughs> to you know, take off. And what will make him take off is, is this series of 108 heroes, not just the tattooed ones, you know. So he, he puts out a set of prints and there's about like a dozen, a little more than a dozen tattooed heroes in, in that series. So that's 1827, 1830. And then mid-career, he comes back and does another set, kind of a revisiting of the same theme, right? And outside of that, he, he does very little um, tattoo prints at all. And um, his legacy also is kind of limited. I mean, I, I think he was remembered as that guy who did those things. But Kuniyoshi's real thing was warriors and myth and this kind of grandiose, you know, heavy. Um, I, 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 I like to see um, visual arts as music and, and Kuniyoshi's like heavy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like symphonic death metal, you know, just fucking <laughs> wow. So, you know, I love the guy, but as far as his, as his position in tattoo history, you know, in, in a, a, he does very few other, um, other tattoo prints, a few kabuki actors, maybe a historical personage or another, but, um, and a handful of his students will go on to do a handful of tattoo prints. Um, Yoshitoshi is his one student, which we could say really carries on the legacy. So he'll do some hero prints and some historical yeah. prints that also feature tattooing. But his stuff's pretty um, metal as well. Yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's like, uh, yeah. There's a there's a dark side, you know. Those both of them had a dark side, and I, I think if people have, if people haven't if people wouldn't even have, yeah, can't place the name of Kuniyoshi in particular, like. It, a lot of the a lot of the the more kind of demonic or skeletal or kind of as you said theatrical things that you can kind of conjure to mind if you've seen some Japanese print work from this period the, the ones that are as as Ben said are darker and weirder or, or you're you're more likely not to be thinking of a kuniyoshi you know the I saw someone do a kind of neo trad Japan or neo Japanese sleeve the other day of the um uh, Mitsukuni and the skeleton you know the huge uh, so th those those kind of yeah those th th that kind of I love that symphonic death metal description of him. I'm never going to think of him in any other way. Um, but that's exactly that's exactly uh, the 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 thing about his work that has really resonated with contemporary tattoo fans, probably, um, which is probably what is what is he said gives him this oversized place in the in the historical storytelling, right? Mm -hmm.